We've spoken about word to vec which is a very popular word embedding approach and word to vec was the embedding approach that really kicked off um, word embeddings in general in the early um, 2010s. And I want to talk about GLOV, um, Global Vector Word Embeddings. And these are quite powerful um, word embedding approaches. And very often, if you want to just download a set of word embeddings, then GLOV would be a good set of word embeddings to download for a particular language. So the idea of GLOV is to combine the ideas from word to vec with some of the more old school ideas that preceded word to vec And I haven't spoken about um, these, but there were actually word embedding approaches um, just before um, word to vec that, that probably inspired the more neural network-like um, word to vec framework. Now, these older school methods, they all relied on co-occurrence count matrices. Okay, so what does that mean? So what you would do is you would construct this massive matrix C where um, each of the elements in C would be the co-occurrence counts of a particular center word with a particular context word. So that's quite similar to what we did with word to vec where you would have a sliding window with some width. But what you would do in these approaches, you, you would simply count up how often does the word C um, as a center word, how often does that co-occur with the word O as a context word. So the nice thing about this is you just sweep your window across and you keep track of, of these counts and you construct this massive count matrix. Okay, you don't have to do gradient descent or anything like that. You just end up with this massive count matrix. And then what they normally did was they applied some matrix factorization approach to get a lower dimensional representation of this um, matrix and in effect get lower dimensional word embeddings. So again, it relies on this principle that words that go together belong together, but you don't um, have explicit word embeddings like a context word embedding and a center word embedding that you're pushing together and using gradient descent to optimize. You simply count up these things and then you get lower dimensional word embeddings by doing matrix factorization. Now the advantages over word to vec is that this is very, very fast. And the other advantage that's a little bit more subtle is that you could capture some global statistics that word to vec misses. Now, if you think about word to vec and you just think about one of those J, the last terms JCO, then this last term is really just considering one center word with one context word in, in that particular window that you're looking at. Okay, if you're using batching, then you're looking at this just in that particular batch. But what happens if you construct this global count matrix is you're basically making a sweep over the entire data set in one go, and then you're, tr you're summarizing all of those global statistics within this big matrix. So you're not just looking at things within a particular context window, within a particular batch, and in the end within a particular a pair of words and trying to push this like one little pair of words together. Instead, you're capturing things that happen over an entire data set in this very simple and fast way. So the idea behind GLOVE was to ask, can we combine some of these advantages from these older school uh, word embedding approaches with the newer word to vec framework? And I'm going to derive the GLOVE model um, basically from scratch to convey that exact intuition. So what we will do is we will use this count matrix and we will use C, the count matrix, the C throw, and the O column is the total number of times in a corpus that center word C occurs with that context word O. So C is this very big matrix. Um, it's got V by uh, V elements and they're all integers. Let me just remind myself what the integer symbol looks like. Okay, it um, looks like this. Okay, um, it's actually also, and, and you can also have zero counts. And this is exactly what you would collect for the old school word embedding approaches. Now, what Glove does is it tries to minimize the squared loss between some model output and the log of these counts. Okay, so we're going to have a little model where we give it center word and um, context word. And what that model tries to do is it tries to predict the log of these counts. 
This isn't the entire glove model. What I will do is I will just start here and with this intuition and then systematically build up so that we end up at the, the final glove model. But I hope this makes sense. So you just, you have a little model here, some parameters theta, and that model tries and gets close to the log of the counts. Okay, cool. And we use the squared loss between the model output and the, um, and the logs. If you've seen you know, any regression model then any re most regression models are trained with a type of squared error like this. Now we could use something fancy for our model. We've defined the loss, but we need to find the structure as well. So maybe we could use uh, a small or a very big neural network to do this. But instead of doing that, we're going to stick with the simplicity of word to vec that really relies on the dot product between different word embeddings. Okay, so in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to say our model for um, the log counts of a center word occurring with a context word is the dot product of a center word embedding with a context word embedding. Okay, plus some bias terms for the center word and the context word. The nice thing about these bias terms are that if either the context word or the center word occurs just a lot in your data set, so they just have in general a large count, then you can actually encode it into these um, bias terms without looking at the dot product between the um, context word and the center word. Okay, so the bias terms can just capture, okay, this word just occurs a lot, so I just need to in general push up this. Um, this value and then the dot product basically tells you about the interaction between the context word and the center word very similar to what we had in um, word to vec so if these two things occur together a lot then we're going to make sure that their dot product is quite large so um, we started with the basic loss but we're going to modify it um, a little bit and we've also defined the structure this is the final structure of the glove model so to modify it what we're going to say is um, you know what I like this loss function but maybe if a word occurs very very rarely then maybe I don't want to weigh this term too much compared to a word that occurs a ton of times then I really want to make sure that this term for that particular combination of two words that occur together a lot, I want to make sure that the model really get that um, a log count um, correct. So what you do is you add a little weight um, function here before the summation, which weighs um, particular combinations based on their count. Okay, so you add this little weight function h before, which says, if the count is very, very high, then I'm probably going to have a relatively high value year before because I care about things that occur a lot. While if the count is just one or two, then I'm probably going to weigh the output of my model compared to the log counts. I'm going to weigh that quite low. Okay, maybe for zero count things, things that never occur together, maybe I don't want to consider them at all. So maybe I want to have a weight of zero for, um, for things that never occur. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So in the glove um, paper, they actually have a suggestion for this H function. And the suggested function looks something like this. So the formally the function is H of X and X is the counts is um, you either um, weigh it by taking X divided by 100. This looks a little bit arbitrary until you see the plot, then, then it kind of makes sense the power of um, three quarters if x occurs less than 100 times or if x occurs more than 100 times then you just have a weight of one so if if something occurs 100 times then you've got a weight of one if something occurs um, 500 times then it's also weighed by um, by one and the function um you need to see it to actually for it, for it to actually make sense um it looks like this um Okay, and importantly, what happens is if you have a count of zero, then you have a weight of zero as well. Okay, so the loss function doesn't really consider any word pairs that never occur together. And that's good because remember what we're trying to predict is the negative log of the counts. And if you have a count of zero, then you've got the log of zero and that's a, a very, very large negative number. Okay, so that's minus infinity and you don't want that. Okay, but anyway, but this weight function 
says, ah, okay, cool. If the count is zero, then I don't actually consider it at all in my loss function. And that's really nice. This also makes training way faster because I don't have to consider all V by V possible word pairs, right? I only have to consider the ones that occur at least once. Okay. And then you've got this weight function, which says, you know, up to a hundred, I weigh things um, like almost linearly. And then after a hundred, I just um, keep it flat and I go on with life. Should be honest, I don't know why exactly there's this like slight weird exponential function that they use and why they didn't just use a straight line. Um, I assume they tried that and for some empirical reason this turned out to work well. But maybe there's actually a better reason for that. Okay, But I hope the intuition actually um, makes sense. Now, uh, exactly like with Skipgram and with CBAL, you actually end up with two sets of embeddings. You end up with the U's and the V's and you can decide which ones of these are you going to use. Am I going to use the context word embeddings or am I going to use the center word embeddings? And now what the original paper proposes in this specific case is actually to just add them up. Okay, so your final word embedding for a particular word class K or word type K is UK plus um, VK. And empirically that just turned out to work quite well. If you want to learn more about GLOVE, but you actually have all the fundamental um, building blocks, if you want to implement GLOVE, then you actually have all the, the skills and the components that you need in order to do that. But if you want to read even more, then I encourage you to read the original GLOVE paper, where there are also some other interpretations of, of GLOVE, specifically linking it to the skip gram loss in a more fundamental way. Um, so you can look at that if you want to know more.